you get that? I'm so confused. Also, ich verstehe nur Bahnhof. You only understand train station? It's all Greek to me. Understanding train station. Living between cultures with Josh and Faye. Welcome back to another episode, everyone. It's been a bit, but we are happy to talk to you again now. A lot has been going on, but I guess not like that much. Uh, just normal stuff in our everyday lives. Yeah, not the uh, interesting. Staying busy with. Uh, the interesting kind of stories. Yeah, not the crazy travels or anything. But yeah, we're back this week with another episode. But before we get into that, how are you doing, Feely? It's been a bit since we've talked. I'm doing well. I almost feel like we kind of ghosted the audience a little bit. We're becoming very, um, our podcast is becoming an American teenager. <laughs> and we're um, uh, ghosting I don't people. know. We've warned people somewhat. But yeah, I mean, we didn't really say that we weren't going to publish an episode. And usually whenever we skip a Thursday, well, our biweekly Thursdays, then at least I post yeah. something on the YouTube mm. community tab, Patreon, Instagram, et cetera. And I'm like, hey, no episode today. Yeah. I didn't even do that anymore. I was like, OK, they already know at this point, like the last few weeks have not been very reliable. They're, they can be happy whenever there is an episode, and then when there's no episode, oh well. Um, that's kind of been the the mode of operations Modus on the understanding. Operandi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the understanding train station side of things. Um, yeah, I, I do apologize though. I hope that you didn't wait on your podcast platform for this new episode. Because I know that when I listen to podcasts and they're supposed to come out on this one day, and a lot of podcasts come out at the exact same time, right? And for me, it's always mm -hmm. cool because I can hear them like a day early. So like if a podcast, because I listen to a lot of German podcasts, so with the time difference, mm. all my podcasts that I listen to that ah, come on Wednesdays, I, I can listen to them Tuesday at 6 p.m. my time. So every time that it's Tuesday, 6 p.m., I'm always like, oh, where are you? Where are you? I'm ready. And then sometimes they get <laughs> You're delayed. You're a time traveler. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they get delayed and then I'm upset. So long story short, I hope that didn't happen to you guys. Um, but yeah, we're yes. back for me, honestly, in the last few weeks the most important story or more, most interesting story because I've worked a lot but nothing super crazy um the most interesting story was that we painted our house the exterior of the house Ooh, so that was kind of cool that's a big cool. job yeah i mean we didn't do it ourselves we hired yeah, people but still <laughs> still making decisions dealing with that so like we had people at least not inside but outside of the house for two weeks straight. Um, we had some tuck pointing tons. So like the, the, the mortar was repaired and then pressure washing and then painting and then making decisions about paints and stuff like that. All this fun adult stuff. Yes. It is done now though. And we're very happy with it. Um, other than that, I went to the Kentucky state fair. That's my ah, big story. That yeah, is that a big interested. story. You didn't say that you didn't mention that earlier. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> um, is that your was, first time at a state fair? I went to the North Carolina State Fair back okay. in 2016, so it's been a while. But at that yeah. point, it was with my friend who went to Duke University, and we just kind of went for fun, like on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. So I think we drank mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, we went on maybe like one ride. We had some food. We like, you know, laughed about all the deep fried Oreo stuff. Yeah. And I remember specifically that a lot of people were walking around with these goldfish in a plastic baggie. Uh, I don't know if uh -huh. that's a state fair thing or what was I going on there. <laughs> I think you can win them maybe at some pro they got some some of the events. I don't know. I think that's what it was. And I, I remember that I was kind of shocked by that because that didn't yeah. seem that didn't seem like an ethical Normal. thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Um but so this time the Kentucky State Fair was in Louisville, which was technically my first time in Louisville, but I didn't actually see the city. You circus. weren't really in the city though, right? Yeah, it didn't really count. Um, a lot of it was inside, which surprised me. I kind of expected everything to be more like outdoors, but um, it was in this big like event arena. Um, at least a lot of it was. There was also an outside area. And the fun part was that there was like a lot of basically animal shows and crops and plants that are being shown so basically for the first two hours we just walk through these halls where there's like all these chickens in cages yeah. and you just look at them and they have prices because they were they won the show like they won they're specifically beautiful or something mm -hmm. like that or big or special and then rabbits and cow like dairy cows and mm -hmm. horses and all that kind of stuff and then we went into the the plant section and there was literally tomatoes on paper yep. plates and everyone like looked at the tomatoes and was like oh that's a beautiful tomato cool <laughs> <laughs> i haven't been to a state fair in forever is the ohio state fair like that as well 
I think so. I think I've only been to a state fair once in my life. Okay. Uh, once or twice. I remember my grandparents taking me once to it. And it was it was similar to that though. Okay. But the the memories are quite fuzzy. We the only thing that really stuck with me was the tractor pool. Did they have a tractor pool while you were there? What is it? A tractor pool? Like they're pulling yeah. something? Pool, yeah, like seen. Mm, um, mm -mm. I mean, they may yeah. have, but I don't think while we were there, it didn't happen, okay. no. Yeah, you have to look it up later. But basically, mm. people will hook their tractors up to this device that has a big weight that's all the way back on this uh, on the trailer. And then as they pull, the weight goes forward, which makes it harder for the tractors to pull. Um, and... Yeah, like the strongest tractor wins, basically. Mm. I think Ben actually told me about this because I now okay. remember a conversation that I had with him, I think a while back, where he ta uh, told me about this. And I was like, oh, what a waste of, you know, like resources. And he said, yeah, some of them explode. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. That makes so much sense. <laughs> that's <laughs> what, America. <laughs> what a useful thing to do. Um, but I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's yeah. entertaining. The funniest part of the plant section, I'm still at that section within my head um was there was hay displayed and okay. tobacco so like literally just haystacks and it's like oh yeah. cool this is this is different hay than this wow which i'm i'm sure is super interesting for agriculture people i'm just not one of those people so i don't yeah. really care that much about the hay um then there was like a section where they were literally showing different cakes so there was a cake competition but you couldn't mm. eat the cakes. You could just look at them yeah. and look like which of the cakes got the the first place, second place. Other than that, though, there was a big um, hall with vendors and stuff like that. There was like really cool fire trucks and a helicopter um, and a big outdoor area with mainly just like live music and um, food stands and stuff like that. I had like the best fresh, freshly, what's it called? Freshly pressed lemonade. Mm -hmm. Fresh pressed lemonade, yeah. Yeah, is that how you say it? Um, I that think was so. So good, it was super overpriced. It's, which I was like, yeah, guys, so delicious, this though. isn't this is in Paris. This is a Munich Oktoberfest. This <laughs> is the Kentucky State Fair. You don't have to charge nine dollars for a lemonade, but it was very good. So, <laughs> very cool. Yeah, I'm glad that you got that experience. That because, yeah, State Fair. That's very quintessential countryside stuff mm -hmm. which I know Ben is good at making you experience but that's a that's just another thing ticked off your list now right for sure Checked I off mean your list. I don't know if I could ever like really watch one of those just shows where then they present the animals I don't know that just yeah. seems a little I know that's a big thing it just it to is. me seems a little weird like bringing your animal and then they're just being judged on how they look it's not even like I can understand a little bit better when it's like an equestrian like competition and they have mm. to perform certain things. But if it's just like, oh, this is a specifically beautiful cow, they get like a price. I don't know. It's kind of weird. To it's me. not it's not just about the way that they look, though, but about the way that you've cared for them, uh, uh, the way that you raised them, so on and so forth. But I mean, I'm not an expert on that. topic. It's its own all. world, basically, is it what really I'm trying is. to say. It's it really its own is. bubble. And I don't really understand it all that much. But anyways, <laughs> it was an experience. So, um, yeah, what about you? I was also in a world that was kind of in its own little bubble recently and yeah. quite interesting. Um, I visited a friend in Thuringen, so in Thuringia, uh, and it was the the Bundesbergmann's Fest or something along those lines. So there were yeah. different, there were different like clubs, which German love Germans love their clubs, of course. The fine. So different, yeah. So there mm -hmm. were different clubs from all over Germany that came to this tiny little village for the Bergmann Fest, which Bergmann Fest just be, or like Bergleuten Fest. It was a uh, for miners, like people who work in the mines and mountains, mm -hmm. basically. And they have like their own special greeting, and like there's like a song that they sing. The greeting is Glück auf. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, <laughs> uh, Feli. I may have. Not sure. Yeah, it just it was it was a very interesting world. There was I learned what a Zapfenstreich is mm -hmm. for the first time because there was a Zapfenstreich that they had. Uh, what is that? Because you also call like Zapfenstreich when it's like last round or when it's time to go to bed. That's like ah, really? an expression. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. But what is it in that context? In that context, it's like a it's almost like a military goodbye. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think like that makes sense. Then that that's where it comes yeah. from. Yeah. Um, but they just took their, 
uh, beruf, their profession so seriously that it has there's been this tradition that has grown around it. Uh, so there was a parade through the old town. Uh, there was a fireworks show. It was a very interesting thing to experience because it's just mm. mostly a whole bunch of old guys walking around in funny costumes, <laughs> uh, drinking beer and listening to brass music. And by funny costumes, you mean kind of like uniforms? Yeah, like uniforms. They basically mm. looked like marching band uniforms mm -hmm. um, that we would know in the U.S. So... It just was, it was an interesting cultural experience as well. Um, something that I don't quite understand, but it was fun to experience and see, you know, kind of mm -hmm. similar with you in the, in the state fair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and what you're describing, I've never, I've never experienced. I mean, of course I'm familiar with kind of these Bavarian parades, um, mm -hmm. but that sounds like a whole different thing. Yeah. And they, they were saying really, if you don't grow up in a region that was known for like having mines, then mm -hmm. it's something that you don't really know. Yeah, it was very funny. Very but then, funny did you drink afterwards? Though. Yeah, I mean, we were having drinks in the in the beer tent. Okay. So like the e yeah yeah the evening was we went and listened to some music, uh, had a few drinks, and then they had the Zapfenstreich, and then you, afterwards it was a mean trick they played on everyone. They had the Zapfenstreich out of the area where the beer was, and okay. the beer was all blocked off. And if you came before the Zapfenstreich, you could get into the area without paying an entrance fee. Oh. And have your drinks and listen to music. Then they got everyone out for the Zapfenstreich. And then when you went back in, you would have to pay an entrance fee of like 12 euro 50. Wow. So Yeah. So we didn't go back in. <laughs> Dude, I'm sure a lot of people were pissed about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but yeah, and then the next day we went to the parade and yeah, it just was nice to be out in the countryside a little bit more and mm -hmm. be back in Thüringen. And I missed the accent a bit. So mm -hmm. it was fun that's to talk true. to people and listen. Yeah, that's kind of so. the, the first German accent that you were in touch with because that's where Frau König is from, your exactly. high school German teacher. And that's yes. kind of like what you said at first, that when you first started speaking German, you kind of had that accent. A, a little, little bit. bit. Yeah. Uh, and like probably a, in Amer some words. An Americanized version of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how else would you? Like, if that's the person you're learning exactly. it from, you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even realize <laughs> that that's the accent you have. But yeah, I mean, right now it's kind of like this end of summer, back to school kind of feeling. I know that mm -hmm. in Germany, I think it's really only Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg yep. that, so two states that are still on summer break in terms of um, school break. And in the U.S., I know that most schools are already back at school or back in school. Back to school. Back in back to school. Back in school. <laughs> back in back school. at school. All of the above. <laughs> um, like for example, all the high schools, they don't all start at the same time, which is interesting. I think it depends on the school district, but then also if it's a private school, they can kind of decide on their own when they go back to school. But I think it all happened like within one or two weeks that mm. all these schools went back into session. And then you see the University of Cincinnati is is back in classes now, and um, I don't know. It's kind of this like. New Year type of feeling, even though I don't even go to school anymore, but I still kind of, I, I get the the sense for it around me. Um, mm -hmm. Two kids actually in, in my family, one relative of Ben's, his little nephew, and then someone in my family as well are starting school, like their first day of school. Aww. So that's exciting, like Schulkinder, Erstklässler. Yeah. But yeah, with that, Lingoda, actually our sponsor for today's episode, they're actually doing a back to school discount to motivate you guys to learn languages if you maybe drop the ball. Like I know you have a little bit with French, right? <laughs> I have to say I have been sticking with my French lately. I've been ah, making good. some progress. But for some people, I'm sure it's, you know, it's been a while since they followed through. Or maybe you just want to learn a completely new language this fall. Then this is your chance because they're doing the special discount. And with our code you. UTS25, you can get 25% off the first two months off the monthly subscription. And just in case you forgot what Lingoda even is, it's an online language school where you can learn French, you can learn German, you can learn Spanish, English, business English, and you learn it in live classes with teachers. So it's not like you're just there by yourself with the screen. You're actually interacting with people. And in the group classes, if you choose to do a group class, you even have the other participants. And it's still like small groups, so it's five people max in a group, which means that it's kind of like a small, you know, familiar, what's the word I'm looking for? Intimate. Yeah, it's like an intimate, it's like a safe space kind of feeling. Yes, like you don't feel so. like you're out on 
in the open in a big classroom. Um, it's still like a small group of friends, if you will. Every class that I've taken with Lingoda, I always felt like there's this overall attitude that everyone gets supported in their language learning progress. Like nobody ever really feels shy to speak in front of the others or makes fun of each other if they don't know something. I feel like it's always been a very supportive atmosphere. So yeah, basically in that back to what I was trying to say, that's the classes that you can book at Lingoda is these live group classes or one-on-one -on -one classes also if you want to do that. Um, and you get direct feedback to your speaking skills. You get a lot of practice and you have native level teachers. So for those of you who are interested in doing the social classes where you're in those small groups, uh, it's up to five students per class, and you can choose five, 12, 20, or 40 classes per month. So there are different options there. And you pay every four weeks. So that's €8.50 or $10 per class. And you can change or cancel the classes at any time. Yeah, and you can like choose the topics directly if you want to or stick with the curriculum that they suggest. And we've said this several times in the past, classes are literally available 24-7. So it doesn't matter which country you live in, which time zone you're in. If you want to maybe do it at midnight or at five in the morning, you can schedule your classes for whenever you're available. And as I said, our discount code is UTS25. With that, you get 25% off the first two months of the subscription. And you can even do a one-week trial first that is completely free where you you can do three group classes, which is actually a lot, or one one-on-one -on -one class during that trial to make sure that this is the right thing for you before you commit. Um, and overall, with our discount, you can save up to 200 euros. So be quick, check out the link in the description below or in the show notes and... Yeah, happy language learning. <laughs> and today, we're actually doing one of the last episodes. If we're correct with our planning, this mm -hmm. is actually the second to last episode of the podcast and we wanted to follow up on a promise that we've kind of given you in the past. I think we mainly talked about it with our Patreon supporters because mm -hmm. it was a topic that I think um, came up in one of our Patreon hangouts that we wanted to talk to HR people, recruiters, both in the US and in Germany, and talk about differences in the recruiting process or rec recruitment process. Mm -hmm. You're right. In the recruiting process. Re recruiting I think both process. <laughs> in the Personalwesen. Um, <laughs> if you are looking for a job in Germany or the US and you're not quite sure what to expect and also how things are handled differently in terms of documents, what it should look like, what to expect also. And so we actually made that happen for today, which is super exciting. We got one expert, I should say. So one person from Germany and one person from the US who either currently work in the HR field or have worked in that field in the past. Tom from Germany, he works in IT, so that's the field that he's from. And then Mark, who's also one of our Patreon supporters, so super happy to have him on this episode today. Yes. Um, he used to do recruiting for a public school district, so that's more like the education field, which is already different in and of itself, of course. Um, but it was still, we learned a lot. I actually learned a lot in this conversation about the German system, too, because yeah. I guess I've been gone for like seven years and I missed out <laughs> on a lot of differences or, or changes that have happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, without further do. We hope that you guys can learn something from this episode and find it interesting. I will say it gets a little technical here and there, but stick with us. I think it's all worth it, especially if you are trying to um, move to the other country to work there or you're already working there and you might you know, be able to learn a few things for your next job application. Like yourself, Josh, you've gone through a few yes. of those recently. <laughs> it would have been very helpful to have some of this information before moving. So we hope that you guys are able to take something from the conversation as well. So we're here now with Tom and Mark. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So this is going to be kind of a different episode, I think, than usually, because we're not just going to chit chat about personal experiences in our lives. I mean, that might also be a, be a thing too, but we're mainly here to get your guys' expertise um, from your professions or previous professions um, in the human resources field, Personalwesen in German, recruiting, and hopefully this can help a lot of people who are either moving to the other country or already live in the other country and have no clue what the application process is like, what work life is like, what the you know, what the expectations are, what the processes are like. But I think even for locals, so Germans living in Germany and working in Germany or Americans working in the U.S., there might be a few things that um, we might all learn today. And for me, this is always interesting, too, because I don't really work in a in an office setting. So I yeah. I don't really know a lot about these things. Um, so, yeah. Anything else you wanted to add, Josh? No, I was going to just uh, second the thanks for thanks for joining us. And I'm particularly looking forward to this as well, because un 
unlike Faley, both in the U.S. and in Germany, I have a bit of experience with applying for jobs and dealing with HR. So um, it'll be interesting to hear your all's perspective. But I think before we get started with the actual topic, um, we would like to hear a little bit about who you guys are from your own perspectives. So maybe Mark, you can start off and tell us a little bit about yourself and what your experiences has been with um, uh, HR in the past. Sure, be glad to. So I was in public education for 31 years, uh, primarily teaching high school uh, and then coaching as well. And then I, uh, oh, number of years after that, about 11, 12, 17 years maybe, I switched over to the dark side and went into administration, became a, a secondary principal, and then eventually was a, uh, my title was executive director of operations and personnel. So I ran a HR at that time for a school district. And um, now I'm retired. Uh, which is semi nice, but uh, anyway, that was my background in HR. And maybe you could just tell us something as well about where you're from in the U.S. Uh, sure, I mean, you don't have to go into specifics, but just to give people a general idea of uh, where your perspective is coming from. Sure, um, my uh, I live in Washington State. Uh, right now, I'm living in uh, what's called North Central Washington State, and that is on the east slopes of the Cascade Mountains. It's absolutely gorgeous here. It's very dry. Uh, we were, what, oh, 102 yesterday. We'll probably get a little over that today, too. Um, mm. Anyway, very, very dry, as opposed to the west side of the state, uh, Seattle, and uh, the University of Washington, where I attended um, both undergraduate and graduate. Uh, they get a lot more moisture. Uh, it's a lot greener. Um, and anyway, so I'm in, a, in this town called... Uh, well, there's actually two towns, Wenatchee and East Wenatchee, Washington. Okay. okay. Yeah, so a different side of the U.S. than uh, our experiences. Yeah, for sure. Very uh, yeah. far away. And so you <laughs> said you hired people for the entire school district, so not just one school. Um, there are two two types of hiring. that I did. I, As a principal, I would hire um, prospective teachers for my particular building. But as an HR director, I had to direct the process for all the different principals who were hiring in their respective buildings. Mm -hmm. So, so I had to oversee that process and make sure it was done uh, appropriately. And um, in many cases, I had to intervene and say, "No, you, you know, you can't write the job description that way." Or, <laughs> you know, for example, there was uh, at the high school in the the district I retired from. Uh, they had a student teacher who everyone seemed to like, and they really wanted to hire him, and uh, and he was very good. There's no question about that. But I, when I read the uh, the job description, they had written the job description specifically for him. Oh. I said, no, you can't. No, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. anyway, I I over I oversaw the process, and I don't know if you want me to get into what the process is. Uh, I'm certainly willing. Not quite I'll, yet, but we'll definitely okay. get into it in, with uh, later on. Um, okay. But just one quick question before we go jump over to Tom. Um, as far as hiring, was it only teachers that you were hiring, or were there was were you also hiring for other positions in administration in the administration of the school district as well? Um, I would hire. I also hired uh, classified individuals, uh, and that could be uh, those folks who are not uh, instructors, not teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when we would hire administrators, that was usually done through the authority of the superintendent. And okay. uh, so I served on committees uh, to hire other administrators as well. And ultimately, the, the, the ultimate hiring decision actually goes to the board of directors, whatever the superintendent or, or we recommend. Yeah, we're looking forward to jumping in, and this is a different, a little bit of a different format for us as far as interviews are concerned. So we are going to be quite try to be quite structured about it. So sorry if we stop you uh, throughout the interview process. We will get to the topics, uh, but we are really excited to hear your guys' stories as well. So maybe jumping over then to Tom. Tom, where are you from, uh, and what is your history as far as HR is concerned? So um, I was born and grew up in the, in a small town near Dresden um, in Saxony. I moved to Munich uh, when I was 18 uh, for my apprenticeship. And this was my start with HR things. Mm -hmm. So um, I was my whole apprenticeship time in a huge HR department. They did nearly everything. So f when I left the company, they started with the hiring processes as well. But they jumped in with the whole 
personal administration, payroll and anything. Also kind of retiring things um, like called in German Betriebsrente. Mm -hmm. So it's like a pension plan. So they nearly did everything. And this was my initial start with HR. And after that, uh, I said to myself, I'm not able to do anything else. So it's HR for the rest of my life. So, and it's like really interesting and cool. Um, after that, I was in a few other companies, um, also HR. Uh, in my study time, um, I had a short, uh, like a smaller position as a working student uh, in, in controlling. Uh, it was super interesting, but not mine. So I turned back to the, to the HR side of life. And yeah, then I started as well in, in recruiting staff, personal administration. So most of the time in like a general role, like doing everything. And right now I'm doing also everything. But right now, currently it's more like recruiting stuff. So um, our general management said, okay, we have to hire people, like not just two or three, like a lot of people. So this is your main focus. Uh, nothing else matters. Like do it. Okay. So yeah. what was the name of your apprenticeship? Was it specifically um, HR related? Um, no. Um, oh, okay. Kaufleute für Bürokommunikation. So it's like, I don't know, it's even the proper English word existing for it. So currently this apprenticeship doesn't exist anymore. It's oh, okay. now called Kaufleute für Büromanagement. Okay. Um, so, okay. but it's still the same. Yeah, I don't know how, how we translate that for the YouTube version. Know. I'm going to put a translation <laughs> so, on the screen. But. I tried. I tried in the past. So I was like, yeah, like office clerk stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So it's stuff. not a problem. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, office, man office, office manager is definitely a term. So uh, kind of maybe office office management uh, would might, might get close. But we'll do some research and put the proper uh, yeah. translation that we can find in the video as well. Okay, so with that knowledge, thank you guys so much for joining me because now we want to kind of compare what the recruiting process is like in the U.S. compared to Germany, how certain requirements are different, how the process itself is different, um, how some of the documents might be different that the applicants have to submit. Um, and maybe we could just kind of start out with talking about how the process usually starts, if, and this is a big question, so maybe we can kind of um, keep it short. So how, how does it go from start to end? And maybe we'll jump back to Mark. Um, how many rounds of interviews are, or how do you even list the job, first of all? Then do you, had, do you usually have like an application form? Because I know the U.S. uses a lot of these automatic systems, which I don't think are that common in Germany, but Tom, you can correct me later on if that's wrong. Um, and then... I believe that there's usually more interview rounds in the U.S. than in Germany. So what's the whole process look like in the U.S. usually? That is a huge list of questions. <laughs> well, as I said, try to kind of like just walk us okay. through the steps as compactly as possible. <laughs> okay, I'll go from two sides. One is the employer side and then one is the employee side. Right. So, uh, and I'm going to be speaking primarily towards teachers. Mm -hmm. So when a when a teacher uh, finishes their uh, university career and they get their t uh, teaching uh, license or certification, then th their information from their college, their grades, their transcripts, and all of that goes to some uh, like a career uh, placement office at the university. Mm -hmm. At the career placement off uh, office at the university. Uh, prospective school districts will also post openings so the uh, graduating, uh, the, te the new teacher can go to the placements office and find out where there are openings. These openings are also posted on the internet and certainly they're posted on a, a school district's website. So th that's how the two can come, can come together. Next, the, uh, the candidate would uh, fill out a, uh, an application form And, uh, and as well, uh, create a resume, and uh, all that gets sent to the school district uh, for them to uh, peruse, take a look at. Usually there's a writing sample involved in the application process as well. Uh, likewise, in, uh, in Washington State, and I think probably all around the country, uh, background checks and fingerprints are now required. Um, back in the dark ages when I started, uh, they didn't do that. 
but uh, that's all required now. And there's there are two levels of background check. There's the state level, and then there's the federal level through the FBI. So all that has to be completed. That's sent to the school district. Then the school district will form a uh, team. Let's say they're going to hire uh, a uh, mathematics teacher at the high school. So the principal will gather some of the teachers together, and they will uh, go over all the applications. Now, uh, as I had mentioned earlier in the, the job description, uh, which the candidate has seen, uh, the applicants are then screened against that job description. For example, uh, uh, some certain course may be re- required for the candidate to have successfully passed. Others uh, may say uh, a certain course is preferred. Hmm. But it, So anyway, th- then the, uh, the applications are then screened down to a more manageable size. And uh, then after that is done, then um, uh, the team with the principal will decide, well, we need to talk to these three or four people, find out a little bit more about them. Because we already know what their background is. We know what their courses they've taken. If they have ex- prior experience, we know what that is. But we need to actually talk with them. And then that will be the interview that the candidate will have. Then based on the uh, interviews, the team will meet back again and decide which candidate they want to uh, make an offer uh, to, and then um, they will clear that with the superintendent and then uh, a- actually make the offer. And then the, the job of the principal, um, because they get the big bucks, is they get to call all the unsuccessful candidates and uh, give them the bad news. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, and that's a very quick uh, shot at how, how it's done. Yeah, thank you. So, would you say generally it's then one uh, one interview round, or generally it would be one round of interviews in your experience? Yeah, for a teacher, typically it's one. Uh, in hiring an administrator, uh, and certainly if a district is hiring a new superintendent, there will be at, at least two, sometimes three different interviews uh, with different constituencies. For example, mm-hmm. in hiring a superintendent, uh, the superintendent would meet with teachers. They he'd meet with, or she would meet with administrators. He or she would also meet with uh, community members, and then ultimately uh, that decision is, is going to be made by the school board, mm-hmm. which typically consists of a, of uh, five members. I was going to say, what was your experience with that, Josh? In terms of interview yeah. rounds in the U.S., I just was going to say, I think as far as the general process is concerned, I would say it is lined up pretty much with mm-hmm. what I experienced in the U.S. Especially right out of uh, university, our university also had for non-teaching jobs platforms where you mm-hmm. can see what uh, which organizations or which companies are working with the organ uh, the university and post jobs. So there was a platform where you could go look there. Uh, also, career fairs that took place uh, on universities' mm-hmm. campuses. Yep. I think the main thing that stood out to me as far as the difference was the fingerprinting. Uh, mm-hmm. Fingerprinting for your average job in the U.S. isn't required, um, but it makes sense that for a state job um, like being a teacher that it would be required. So I think as far as my experience, I would say it lines up pretty much right. I, there was a drug test that I had to take for my jobs in the U.S. as well. Um, I don't know if that's something that's standard for, for teachers, Um but as far as a background check, that was definitely standard as well. That's definitely one of the big differences that I had on my notes is like background checks and drug tests. Um, I don't think are common in Germany, but um, maybe now let's move over, over to Tom. Um, so Tom, could you basically answer the same question um, for the process in Germany in your experience? So normally when you're looking for a job, you have like all the um, job platforms like Stepstone, Indeed, and some local versions. Um, and then you have normally job description. Everything is like fancy in, in color and so on. Um, you can simply click on apply button. In the best case, you just have to fill in one side or even better, you put in your LinkedIn um, account information mm-hmm. and it's like link directly and then you don't need a CV at some point. Depending on companies, um, there could be a, a motivation letter, CV and like some references. Uh, um, but normally it's not a common thing anymore. So normally it's enough to have your CV. Um, you apply for it and then the recruiter gets in touch with you in a short way. Like, hey, we received it. Um, thanks. We will come back to you as soon as possible. Then, so from 
my company right now, we inviting people to a Teams interview. And the first step, it's with um, normally the head of, of this like um, department uh, and myself. It's around an hour. And after that, if everything is like fine with it and says, okay, it was a really nice interview, then we invite for a personal interview in, in our office. Um, and the people get to know also some potential future colleagues. They can, I call it feeling the vibes in the office mm -hmm. um, so that they have a full picture of everything. And is everyone fine with it as well? Then we are making contract ready. A quick question. So things actually change them because I feel like when not just when I went to school, but also with like a lot of my friends who have a regular nine to five job, I always felt like in Germany, it was still very common to have a Bewerbungsschreiben. And that was usually considered more important than the resume. So then the CV, as you said, the Lebenslauf. Um, and I also remember that in a lot of cases, you at least had to send it in as a PDF via email or for some jobs, even physically via mail. So I guess that has changed or is it mainly your industry so, that you work in? So, um, no, it's like super seldom if you have to send it via post, like yeah. a physical post. So this is not I mean, it depends anymore. on the industry that you yeah, work so, in. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, when, when I started my, my apprenticeship, it was in 2009. So mm -hmm. I sent it via like physical post. So this was something else, also via email. Um, and um, But now you normally have platforms. Like mm -hmm. you have a homepage. Um, so you have a career site on your homepage. So all the jobs are listed. You're using different platforms. So in my special field, it's like in IT area, um, especially IT security area. So you, you're not waiting for applications because they're not coming. So you're working with headhunters um, or doing um, active so search. Mm -hmm. So I have a re LinkedIn recruiter, for example. So I'm looking for people for myself. Write them. So, hey, your profile looks nice. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to? talk so this is like the new of everything so it's not the old stuff from for like 15 years maybe just to add from my experience as well like uh since moving to germany i've looked for <laughs> jobs uh, a few times now and obviously i work in the tech industry so maybe there are some differences but i think generally um what i've seen a lot of is Because I do know that like the Anschreiben, the, the motivational letter used to be a big thing. Mm. Most job uh, descriptions that I see now have it as optional. The mm. only thing that isn't optional is a uh, is the CV. Is what I've has been my general um, my general observation. I would say interesting. That makes it so much easier because like I know yeah. that for example my I friend never sent one <laughs> that well one, one of my friends works oh really one of my friends works yeah. in um, administrative so like in a Behörde which is obviously okay. super old school in Germany so they yeah. 100% need everything in person and print it out and yeah. whatever but another friend yeah. also works in engineering and she also um, just recently went through um, a big application process and I remember that for at least a few of the jobs she had to send in the um, Bewerbungsschreiben so the letter of letter of motivation basically yeah. and then I mean usually if you do that and you apply to a lot of jobs um, for those that still where that still applies um, you just kind of like try to have some kind of default letter and then you kind of adjust it to whichever company you're applying to, to but I remember to that used to yeah you <laughs> well and you, you're always supposed to like Uh, mention certain specific details about the company or about the role that was yeah. mentioned. But I just remember that in school and after school, mm -hmm. this used to be such a big thing. So that's great mm -hmm. that that's not that big no. of a deal anymore in Germany. Yeah, so um, I when I was applying for another job, um, I had also some, some, some companies, they wanted the motivation letter. I was like, no way. So I stopped immediately the process, not applying for it. Or like kind of life hack, uh, I like uploaded my CV again. Mm. So, so this is not going to happen that I uh, write the motivation letter again. Mm. So this is totally old school. Um, and more honestly, um, like recruiters looking a few seconds on your resume and then that's it. And then they decide. Um, so it's not worth the work For from, sure. from um, the applicant side. And we don't have actually time to look everything in detail. 
um, also letter of references. Um, I know this is a part later on, but this is also a thing, like a lot of people sending everything, CV, motivation letter, references, and so on, and no one is looking at it. Just what you did in, or what you're doing right now, what you did in the past, and then that's it. So mm -hmm. this is like the whole source that you need normally when you decide to invite someone. Tom, I would be interested to know what your experience with background checks in Germany has been. Since I have worked at an American company and other non-German headquartered companies, um, I and also in more high, like with data information, uh, I have had to do uh, background checks for uh, my last two positions, but I don't think that's a standard in Germany, would what, what would you say? No, not really. So I would okay. say it depends. So I know if you're working for specific fields, uh, for example, Airbus, uh, so they doing background checks extensionally. Mm. Also, mm -hmm. when you work for German government, um, especially um, like the BND, um, mm -hmm. so um, they the are German also doing, equivalent of the CIA. Yeah, they doing extended background checks and so on, but like normal companies not doing this. Um, when I started working for my apprenticeship, we needed in German called Führungszeugnis. Yeah. Um, so so you're like going to record, the, yeah, yeah, if you have any criminal records. Um, so it's, I think, still the thing when you're working for um, bank companies or insurance companies. Um, what about drug tests? Nope. Okay, not yeah. as far as I know. Have you so, ever had to do one, Josh, in Germany? In Germany, no. Okay. Uh, for all of my jobs, and maybe Mark, you can say something to this as well. Um, but since I was working in manufacturing environments, um, a drug test I think has something to do. Maybe it has something to do with that. But um, I think a drug test is quite quite common in the U.S. as far as starting a new new position. Sorry, I have a fly here that's uh, <laughs> distracting. Me. Um, I think it's probably uh, dependent on the role that the employee is going to take. I know uh, our transit company in our area would hire a lot of people, but uh, because marijuana, recreational marijuana is legal in this state, uh, they could test positive for it, even though they're not the least bit intoxicated. Yeah. Uh, one of the trace elements lasts forever, so it prevents them from hiring uh, qualified drivers. Certainly if you're driving or something like that, yeah, that's that's pretty common. I'm not, uh, I'm not aware... Now, if that's required for uh, for school employees, um, mm -hmm. I just don't know. Yeah, no, I, that's also something that has changed a lot since I've left too. Is yeah. a lot more states have legalized uh, recreational marijuana, so uh, I think some of those uh, habits will change as far as drug testing is concerned. But that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah. I was actually very surprised though when I first came here, and I had a lot of friends who weren't drivers and they just worked in just I would call like regular jobs nothing super higher up like a starter uh, job and they had to do drug tests and I think in some jobs even regularly I think depending on on the industry you work in but definitely to get started and then that would always be kind of like a bigger thing especially because yeah. here marijuana isn't legal um, I, I mean I'm assuming they also test for other drugs but with marijuana that would always then be a thing that people would have to try and stop if, if they did smoke marijuana to stop in time so that then by the drug test there was no trace anymore um, yeah. so that was a very surprising cultural difference to me when I first came here because I'd never heard about that in Germany. It also uh, is a function of the liability that a company might uh, have to assume. And so mm -hmm. their insurance companies may say, look, uh, you know, you need to test these folks. If they do something wrong and they're under the influence, you know, you are responsible. So mm -hmm. uh, the issue of liability, uh, particularly in the United States, where we love to sue everyone for everything, uh, that's, that's a, it can be a real eye opener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, next up, I wanted to talk about the Lebensläufe because that was also a question from some listeners um, that have messaged us about this topic. The resumes look pretty different in Germany and the U.S. Um, maybe we can start with what a resume looks like in the U.S. I believe that also maybe for teachers, do you guys do mostly like CVs or is it regular resumes? Um, resumes, CVs, both. Uh, sometimes they're blended together. Okay. You, you were talking uh, talking earlier about a, a letter of motivation. Is that like the introductory letter? 
Yeah, yeah. It's basically okay. a letter okay. that you can send with your CV. It's normally yeah. like what one page where you're supposed to yes. express your interest in the job and why you're applying. Right. Okay, that's very common too. And actually, okay. uh, uh, that can be pretty interesting because um, you can find out more about the candidate that that the uh, the resume or the CV is not going to show. However, on a, a resume or a CV, uh, you cannot uh, state uh, your gender. Mm. You cannot uh, state your age. You cannot divulge. Uh, you cannot have a photograph. All that stuff is uh, is not a, not a, not allowable. As a matter of fact, in some cases, I, I've seen several where it was difficult to determine: if, is this a woman applying or is this a man applying? Because the names can sometimes uh, n- not be uh, particularly just, helpful. Just to jump in that real quick, Mark, is it? My understanding is that it's definitely not common, and that employers can't require it. But I, I think you can. Te- if I wanted to, I could put it on there. But it, it wouldn't be a. You're as an employer, you're not allowed to discriminate based off of those features. So that is why it's oftentimes left off of the resumes. Is that correct? Yes, it would be okay. unusual to see something like that, and definitely uh, uh, we cannot ask. It, it, if when you get to the interview stage, you absolutely cannot ask. Uh, also, uh, a pretty important part is the uh, references that the candidate will leave. And, uh, you know, you track down, you contact those references. Uh, in some cases, you you may know someone from another school district who's not listed as a reference, but may have had can, uh, contact with the candidate. So you've talked with them as well. And I know one, uh, one time when I was hired at a very large school district in Bellevue, Washington, uh, they wanted to they wanted to look at my references. And then they also wanted to know uh, the the names or the contact information for the parents of a student I had suspended. So they, I mean, they really dug deep. Wow. That's a little unusual, but they, the references okay. are important. So for the things that are not common, so that includes a photo isn't common in the U.S., no. age isn't common, right? That you put your no, um, date of birth. No. Then like nationality, also no, right? Uh, no, uh, U.S. citizenship, that, you, yeah, you can ask that. Mm, okay, because of the visa situation. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, that makes sense, actually. Um, in Germany, also, I think sometimes marital status can be on the, on the resume. So can't that would also that. not be a thing. Nope. Okay. Not in the U.S. And then, um, yeah, with that, let's, let's go over back to Tom. So um, those things, I think, are even required <laughs> in most cases in Germany, right? Um, I would or say common. common. Yeah. More common, not required. So um, normally you have a picture uh, on your CV, uh, the whole birth date, um, probably at some point also citizenships, so especially when they're not German. Mm-hmm. Some of the people put also their religion on it, mm-hmm. so um, so it's not required. So we don't need that information, so it doesn't really matter. But it's also like kind of more in common right now that people just um, flip the picture. So there's no picture on the CV. Um, today, I, I had an interview uh, with a person. Um, so he he doesn't have the um, picture on the CV and also not his uh, birth date. So it was like completely kind of not left, but kind of left. And I was like, what? What is this? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, it's <laughs> so unusual. So I, I was kind <laughs> yeah. of like confused at some point. Uh-huh. And then you see the person the first time in the interview. And it's like, ah, okay, I didn't expect that, actually. <laughs> so mm-hmm. normally you, you, yeah, you have a picture of this person in your head. And it's like kind of like, oh, it's like kind of surprising that it's like, okay, I, I imagine this person like that or like completely different. Like, oh, like this is the guy. So, okay. It's like weird. But normally we have also um, a law against discrimination based on this information. Um, in German, it's called Allgemeines Gleichhandlungsgesetz. So you're not allowed to discriminate people because of um, sexuality, age, gender, religion, and so on. So this whole law is to protect um, employees and um, applicants. Yeah, of course, you never know if people are actually following that 
law and if maybe recruiters are subconsciously discriminating. I mean, there is a lot yeah. of studies on with certain last names, if they sound more Middle Eastern or if women versus yeah. men with the same qualifications, etc. Of course, there's like mm -hmm. a lot of psychological stuff going on there. Yeah. So in the past, we had this kind of issue. So um, like an applicant wrote in his motivation letter, who's obviously not in your in your viewing list i would say like not you're just looking at the cv and that's it mm -hmm. so he wrote in a small sentence that he's disabled mm. um and we just sent him like a general so okay thanks for your application this is not working out um so thanks for your time good luck for job search and he was like requesting why he was refused and we didn't answer because no at this point we, we didn't even answer to these requests And then we got a letter from a lawyer oh. and we had to pay um, like three monthly salaries. And it was like super expensive at some point. Interesting. So this can happen, but because of the law, the, the AGG is the short version. Um, so it's protecting these people and they take it extremely seriously. It, it can be in the worst case um, an image damage. Mm -hmm. And this is like a worst case scenario for every company. Yep. That's one thing that the U.S. It's just the approach I think is different in 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 the in the attempt to not dis discriminate. We therefore aren't allowed to ask. Whereas in Germany, it seems like you're allowed to ask, or it's expected to give that information. But on the back end, you're not allowed to discriminate based off of that information. So interesting difference between the two. I have a quick th general like note about yeah. that for both countries, just in general with LinkedIn and everything being so much bigger now. I mean, now in the US, you do see the picture, though, if, if the mm -hmm. application takes place via LinkedIn and you see all this other information that you may have not seen before. How does that change the, the recruitment process in the US? Well, well, in the U.S., what I mentioned er earlier about the criteria and the job description, that's why that is so critically important. Uh, for example, if you have so someone who applies and is, and is disabled, uh, you, you have to, and they are not going to be accepted, then you have to re re relate that back to the criteria. Otherwise, you're inviting a visit from the Office of Civil Rights, and that is one group you do not want walking, knocking on your door. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you have to be very careful in your recruiting and your recruiting documents that you can use that to uh, separate. I was going to say discriminate, but separate one candidate from the other. But it's got to be based on on some published criteria. Okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. I think also uh, just a question building off of that. As far as your experience is concerned, other social media as well. So obviously LinkedIn is um, <laughs> a more professional platform, but in your experience, do companies look at other social media networks? So Facebook, Instagram, if someone doesn't have uh, that account private, then you can get a lot, see a lot mm -hmm. about that person. Sure. Uh, you know, LinkedIn is huge. And, um, you know, so you'll see a, probably a photograph, you'll see the CV or resume, and you may have Uh, find out other things. Facebook can be a, a, a gold mine of information you do not want to find, but nevertheless, yeah, it's all out there. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just how well people, uh, you know, take care of that information. Was that part of your of the process? Would you guys usually look into that on purpose? In my experience, LinkedIn didn't exist at the time. Oh. However, comma. Uh, we would uh, contact other folks in other school districts that we knew, you know, our network. And, yeah. uh, and then we could find out a little bit more or we know someone who worked with them before. So, uh, you know, what's this person like and mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. And then, of course, in the interview, well, the interview process is, is another topic. But uh, basically, you know, the joke on who we're going to interview, we're going to interview these five candidates. They all look great. We just got to make sure they don't have two heads. Um, And um, you can find out some other information. Frequently, candidates will volunteer information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, before social media existed, you would just yeah. use the regular network, the social <laughs> exactly. network, to get yeah. all this information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The networks are have, have been there, and they still are, and they're even bigger now. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Tom, what's been your experience with that as far as using not only LinkedIn, but other social media platforms? Not really. Not from my okay. side. So it... Yeah. It depends probably also on the background check. So um, I would say like bigger companies doing at some point a background check, like 
just Google the name and like it shows you everything. Yeah. Um, so especially Facebook or Instagram, or probably as well TikTok right now. Yeah. Um, but I'm not doing this. So I don't have time for this. And yeah. I'm not sure if I want to see these things, honestly. So does it really relate to mm. the person at work? If like someone is like, partying the whole time and in the free time so it doesn't really matter um when you when you're looking for someone to hire yeah. in my opinion so yeah i think that's probably that's not. i think generally though and we'll, I, i'd like to get into this later i think that's a big difference between the us and germany in my experience at least is the german culture doesn't really care what you do in your free time uh you're an employee <laughs> during your work hours and that's kind of it Whereas in American culture, you're always carrying the name of the com company that you're working for and you always pose a risk. So I think there is more of a, um, a vested interest in the American culture to look into what someone does in their private time, hence the, the drug testing as well. But like I said, that's a whole other topic. I and think we more, want to stick to the hard wine. facts at this first. Well, yeah. at, at this point, I would kind of like to throw in real quick that we actually mm -hmm. talked about the work culture and those kinds of things in uh, one of the episodes with Niklas. So I'm going to make sure and link that in the show notes and here on YouTube. So if you guys want to watch that, I think with Niklas, we talked a little bit more about how personal do we get in the workplace. Mm -hmm. You use first names. We talked about golfing and all these fun little like work culture differences. Um, but today we're kind of trying to stay a little bit more on the uh, application process and like the official things and the and the legal things uh, one more thing about the resume that we haven't talked yeah. about josh what what did you want to say no i just was going to say you talked about being more formal and now that we're having mm -hmm. a for we have a former teacher here i th i feel like the education system in the u.s is one of the few areas where you still oftentimes hear people referred to by their mr or mrs some so such and such i don't know If the teachers do that amongst themselves, I think now less than maybe in the past, but it's, I still feel like it's very common um, to, to hear people at least referred to just by their last name. Um, I don't know how you, what, what your opinion on that is, Mark. Uh, colleague to colleague, there's, uh, it's primarily first name. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, certainly uh, for students, they always refer to you by a, a formal address, always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, I just was interested on that, but jumping back to what you were saying, Feli, as far as the other thing that we, we've haven't talked about it as far as the CV is concerned. Yeah. I just thought in terms of like, um, for anyone who is trying to apply, this is like an important piece of information. I think, um, that resumes look also not just in terms of that information that is or isn't there, but just the, the format of it is pretty different in the U S compared to Germany. Um, Mark, what does it look like in the U S typically? What will you find on a resume and how long is it? Two pages is good. Three pages is a little long. Uh, but, uh, it, it's typically a chronological, uh, you know, what you've done, your d various positions and responsibilities in those areas. And then uh, as you get further into the, further down the list, uh, it'd be s like some interesting uh, topics or activities that they've done, you know, outside uh, the typical Uh, curriculum. So, for example, you work for the National Science Foundation or in the summer or something like that. The idea there is that you want the people reading their resume to, to think, this person really sounds interesting. We need, you know, and this one seems to be different than, than so many others. There's some special qualities. So we need to go a little further. And perhaps that's, that's the reason you want to interview. Last of all, our, uh, the candidate will ident identify uh, various references. And usually an American resume has like for each of those jobs that you've and positions that you've had previously, it'll list like a couple bullet points as to mm -hmm. what exactly you did in that position, right? Yes. And then uh, likewise, any uh, particular awards that a, a, you know, a person has achieved over the course of their career. Mm -hmm. So Tom will tell us a little bit what it looks like in Germany, but at least um, traditionally in Germany, it was usually not as in-depth. Uh, maybe that has changed. We'll find out here in a second. But that was one of the reasons why I at first always thought, oh, it makes sense that letters of motivation um, aren't as common in the U.S. because a lot of that is actually included in the resume already. Like this whole like showing how great you are and all of your accomplishments, that's already listed in the resume. Whereas back in the day in Germany, you would kind of just list your job position. Um, one more thing that I wanted to ask about the resume in the U.S. or just in general the, the applicant, how important are things like extracurriculars and volunteering and those kinds of things in the U.S.? 
Well, uh, there have been many longitudinal studies in uh, pr- primarily in high schools trying to determine uh, what are the indicators that would predict later success in life. And, and it's not grades. The number one consistently has been uh, activities, extracurricular involvement, whether it's in the school or the community or whatever. So for me, when I'm looking for someone, I'm looking for someone who's going to contribute uh, in many different ways to the, the school district or the school. Uh, I'm not looking for someone who comes in uh, on, you know, puts in their hours and goes away. Mm. Uh, I need I need someone who's going to be a little bit special, a little bit more exciting than that. So more I, committed. I, yeah, yeah. So I and, and it's a sense of professionalism. You know, you're in a teaching is a profession. You don't do it for the money, for goodness sake. Um, so you're looking for some who's really committed professionally to their career, and um, and that's really important. Likewise, something that was touched on earlier. If you're a teacher. Uh, particularly in a smaller town, you are always on. Um, mm. People see you; they run into you. Run into mm. someone in the grocery store. You're not Joe Dokes. You are Mister Dokes, the teacher, and so you're always, always in that role. And uh, consequently, you need someone who recognizes that and uh, can uh, act accordingly. Interesting. I would say that maybe for teachers, that is also a little bit more the case in Germany um, compared to other professions. Mm -hmm. But even for teachers, though, in Germany, um, once the classes are over, we'll have our summer fest, uh, summer fest at a German school and all the teachers will get drunk with the students. And then they're certainly (laughs) not necessarily um, expected to be in a role model position anymore. Yeah, like students kind of understand, oh, this is now their like their actual personality, their free time personality. And it usually doesn't, I mean, it depends on what the teacher does. There were definitely stories in my school where like, okay, a teacher went out to the club with the students on the weekend. And then we didn't really disrespect the teacher for that, but we all talked about how embarrassing his dance moves were, something like that. (laughs) (laughs) So like, I mean. that (laughs) That is the quickest and the best invitation to a career change. In Germany, it doesn't have to be. I mean, that was, an extre- that was an extreme example. And this would have been like in 12th grade or so when, you know, the students in Germany were also older. But um, I've, I've seen that happen and uh, <laughs> it doesn't end nicely. Oh, man. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say, yeah, overall, I think that's definitely a difference in terms of the it also goes yeah. back to the whole work life balance thing and the clocking out. You're not usually expected to represent your work outside of your work hours even for actually teachers. we had like kind of the same situation with mm-hmm. um with a professor and in, in the university i were mm-hmm. and um like he was the disc jockey for a student party at this mm-hmm. evening mm-hmm. and like everyone was like oh yeah he's doing the dj I'm like oh, really cool it was really really funny so and everyone was knowing him on, on the whole campus and like oh yeah, this is the guy is He's professor for I don't know what what is what his uh, majors are, and it was so kind of funny. So it's mm-hmm. like also a good step to connect to the people, mm-hmm. I would say. But maybe jumping back then to the the CV topic, right. um, we've kind of heard a little bit about what um, American CVs look like, and I would one hundred percent agree. Um, for me, it was like a weird thing when I moved to Germany and people had so much color in their CVs as well. <laughs> like mine was just a plain Word document with like a nice standard font that was pleasant and easy to read. Um, and just like we were saying, kind of chronologically, I had my education, my work experience, and under each position, a few bullet points about what I did, hard numbers as far as metrics were concerned that I was able to contribute, any awards, so on and so forth. So I would totally agree with that. And I've used it in Germany as well and haven't had a problem. Um, but then I have adjusted some things um, as far as putting a picture and uh, putting some color as well. Interesting. But you just <laughs> but used maybe, it like yes. in the English version or did you translate it to German? Both. Oh, okay. It depends. It depends on the company you're you're applying at. Yeah. Okay. Back to Tom. What what does yes. a resume look like in in Germany? So it's not totally different. Um, it's more and more common to have for so everyone say it's like the new norm, new normal. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have um, you can start with the actual position, and then go uh, down to the past. I would say kind of ideal way is like four to five bullet points um, what you're doing currently. So, for example, uh, 
um, managing personal administration for 100 people, um, doing payroll, doing recruiting, and have a special project are responsible for Germany and um, overseas location, for example. So that's it. So a short summary of what you are doing. Um, I read also extended CVs and there was like a list like for one job, like this kind of list. And then on the next page, another job. And next page, it was like 25 pages or something. Like, <laughs> okay, so how can we start at the beginning? So, <laughs> um, But normally it's like also kind of two to three pages putting in jobs, um, qualification, trainings at some point if they are necessary for the job, um, like sp special certificates, for example, and some kind of personal touches like via color and also a lot of people putting their hobbies on it. So it's like to get to know the people a little bit more mm -hmm. um, in detail. So you, it's a kind of a small talk process as well in interviews normally. So what are you doing in your free time? So just of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, but that's mostly it. So it's not like super weird anymore like in the past. Okay. So it's more common, but I have to say I have two CVs. I have a fancy one, like it's colorish, um, it's super short, and I have a like normal HR style one. It's like three pages, a front page with my photo on it, some some short summaries of what I did in the whole past, and then the other two sides, like my job. Interesting. So basically all of these differences that I was thinking of aren't even really existent anymore. Apparently it's both, or I feel like the German system is getting closer to the American system in that sense. Um, when I still applied for things, my resume in Germany would just be literally the job position from when to when did you do it, maybe where it was located. Um, that was it. It didn't really include any mm -hmm. description about what I did in that position or what I've achieved or what I've learned or anything like that. So I think it makes sense, though, to adjust it to the American way. So that's I'm, I'm learning yeah. a lot today about Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's still on, on the page. So the company uh, from when till when, the location probably. Um, but that's it. So you don't mm -hmm. need, like, especially a motivation letter anymore because everyone put everything in the motivation letter before. Exactly, like yeah. Like reading exactly the same thing as in the mm -hmm. CV. And it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just was going to add to that when I, I remember before I moved to Germany and was just kind of visiting every once in a while and had my German friends, I saw their CVs uh, and they looked very different mm -hmm. uh, to what I was used to in the US. Very different, very bare bones, little, very little information and it was a significant difference. But now I would agree like from what I've seen from Germans I know... And like I said, I, it's hard for me to differentiate between because it's in tech and it's kind of an Americanized sector um, where the overlaps truly are. But I definitely have seen a difference in CVs that I've seen in the last two, three years compared to what I saw maybe five or seven years ago. Um, Crazy. And sh with a shift towards the American uh, style. So it also depends on like the, the field where you're working. Mm. So especially when you're working in marketing, your CV like kind of has to be like super fancy, super cool. So because it's like kind of required, like not officially, but people want to see something. So they're like super creative people and they want to see like actually creativity in your CV. So there's just some exceptions from the new standard. Mm -hmm. Just one quick question story regarding to CVs or in regards to CVs. Um, how do you guys recommend people handle spaces between jobs and or how is that handled in different countries when you see that someone has let's say a year of not working or a few months of not working um, is that something that is common that you've seen or how do how is that viewed by either culture we'll say I would I would call that very uncommon um, at least in in the field of education and they may take a year off to do an independent study or something else, or perhaps they're going to guide uh, people down the Grand Canyon or whatever. But uh, typically, you don't see a lot of that where they just have no job at all. Uh, th th those times are accounted for, if not, well, certainly on their resume or CV. And if and if there is a gap, that's something you want to find out about. What, what would you say, Tom? How is that seen in Germany or how is that handled? 
I have seen a lot of CVs and a lot of gaps as well in the past. So I was hiring in the past uh, blue and white color workers. Um, so this is a difference. Um, like at some point, um, it's explaining itself because they're moving to Germany. So they're quitting their job, moving to Germany. And this is a whole process thing that you can start working here. So you need at some point um, the Aufenthaltstitel or visa or something like this. Um, and then some people are doing like kind of sabbatical. So is this like a common English word or is it like a German yeah, word? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a known okay. word. Okay. And so they're doing um, sabbatical for a year or one and a half years. Um, or at some point when you have smaller gaps, like two to five months or That means normally they are un unemployed and looking for jobs. Um, so you normally can see it properly on the CV. Um, but bigger gaps, normally it depends on the whole CV. Um, could be also like school, university, um, trainings, time off, um, or like the long-term long on unemployed people as well. So normally you, you have a guess when you look at the CV. Mm -hmm. Is it usually is that that an you issue? Would, yeah, I was going to say that's something you would ask a candidate about? In the interview, so yeah, it was like, not like four, four five months gaps, like, but bigger gaps. So, oh, wait, wait, but we, what, what was he doing? Where are you doing? What were you, yep. Um, uh, uh, in this place, we were traveling or what did you do? And there's like, yeah, I was in, in Asia and I traveled to whole companies and I did work and travel and was super cool. And so, ah, cool. So then you have something you can relate on mm -hmm. and you have like cool conversation. Um, but smaller ones, I don't even mention that. So mm -hmm. I don't mind, honestly. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just think that's, I, I feel like those type of gaps are definitely more common in Germany just because Germans tend to travel more and go away for. <laughs> good chunk of time huge amount of time yeah <laughs> yeah uh, compared to the u.s i just was interested um yeah i definitely feel like that's a n maybe not a, putting it as a red flag uh would be a kind of an overstatement in the u.s but people were definitely like okay what were you doing that during that time mm -hmm. yeah bailey do you have a, another question yeah we have yeah. a viewer question or actually from our patreon community um from kai who you know mark because you're also a patreon mm -hmm. supporter yeah um and he really noticed in his company a difference when it came to like arbeitszeugnisse and certificate so like official grades and certificates and he noticed that uh, applicants from he i think he said specifically the u.s didn't really have those things and they mostly came with those letters of recommendations or with those references or just explained in detail what they did in their previous position whereas he said as a german he wants to just have like a, a black on white grade and a certificate from the previous employer where it just says yep this was an a plus employee perfect moving on so um that was a topic that i wanted to address and to um yeah answer kai's question what is your experience with that tom so uh I, I try not to laugh so hard. So okay. yeah, I saw I, you laughing. So I, I was like, okay, like this thing. Um, so normally, um, most of the people are not looking on this certificate. So um, right. So currently, you can force your current employer to give you a like really good letter of. As a, I wouldn't say it's a kind of reference letter, but like certificate, working certificate. So would that be an Arbeitszeugnis, or what would yeah. you call it in German? Okay, it's Arbeitszeugnis. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and you can be like kind of forced by law to give someone a good grade. Mm -hmm. And so th they doesn't mean anymore like they did in the past. So there's okay. special language as well for these kind of certificates. So it's like, uh, like really, a really special language, like, it's like bureaucracy codes. language. Yeah, it's, so Teugnissprache, yeah. And yeah, everyone phrases. in recruitment knows yeah. what these phrases mean, but yeah. they're kind of like sugar You can Google all of them. Yeah. Um, and so they sound like really nice the whole time, but they're mm. kind of mean at some point. Um, but normally you, you see you see the, the, um, the, the um, Teugniss, sorry. <laughs> It's okay. so late. <laughs> we don't really have a good uh, a good we don't they don't really exist in the US. Uh, so yeah. that's why it's hard to translate. If I'm looking on it and if they send something, um, I look at the last phrase. Normally this is the truth, how they they um, separate from each other. 
So is it okay. like, uh, oh, uh, we're so sad that he's leaving the company because he wanted to do something else? Or is it like, yeah, we agreed to like separate from each other? Mm. Oh, so okay. that tells you a lot how the process of ending the, the former uh, employment was. But they are still common, so you do still see a lot of Arbeitszeugnisse. Yeah, so it's okay. as, normally it's not really required. Mm -hmm. um, some companies doing this as well, as long with the, the uh, motivation letter. Um, but honestly, I don't kind of need dying it. dying out? It's, yeah. Okay, So I have for all my jobs a uh, um, Zeugnis, but if some people want to see them, so I, I will send them, but mm -hmm. not in the initial application. But so in the U.S., from what I understand, this has never even been a thing, right? No. Um, in education, for example, in order to, to stay current and retain your certification, uh, you I'd see in Washington, it is at 150 hour, clock hours of trainings, uh, sanctioned trainings over a period of three years. Attorneys have the same thing where they need clock hours to show continued professional development. Um, and you get a certificate and then you uh, hide it or forget where you put it. But uh, yeah, th that's important. Likewise, in education, uh, the way you earn more money is you get uh, more university credits. Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, uh, you, at, with a master's degree, you're going to earn more. With a PhD, you're going to earn more, even more. So there's this built-in incentive to continually build up your professional training. Mm -hmm. So the, we don't use the Arbeitszeugnis, is that what it is? Yeah, Ab Arbeitszeugnis, yeah. Okay. yeah. Zeugnis okay. is also so what we get as students, so like at the end of every school year, like where your um, grades are on. What do you guys call it? Just like a transfer? Grade card? Well, yeah. yeah, grade card. Is that what we call it? Yeah. I haven't thought about report grade card. card. A report card, that's it. Report, report card. Yeah, yeah, report card. Yeah, and those come out. It would be that same word in German. So in this, kind of, yeah. in this case, okay. it would just be a work report card, basically. So I'm not going to I'm not going to see when when a teacher moves from one district to to my district. I'm not going to see that. So this was also um, a viewer question: um, Is it a thing? And if so, is there a difference between Germany and the U.S. that recruiters use personality tests with applicants um, and maybe even define beforehand which personality type would be perfect for the role? Mark, you go first. <laughs> Uh, some can use personality tests and there, there are several out there. They're kind of fun to take. Um, but generally it's not necessarily required. However, to get at that information, uh, I always use the interview process okay. and there are several questions, uh, that we would ask that would help determine whether this person is a uh, uh, self uh, self motivated uh, or as maslow used to talk about it self actualizing individual as opposed to a maintenance person mm -hmm. who is there as, essentially for uh, you know the paycheck and so on and so forth uh, and uh, with with teaching and education that's that's pretty important so there are some questions you can ask during the interview process that will get at that, where you can understand this person is really self-actualized, self-motivated, as opposed to someone who is not. And those things are, are pretty important for educators. But did you use any type of categor categories for that? In terms of like these personality tests, you know how there's different personality tests oh, yeah. out there and yeah. they have like their yeah. names for different personality types. Would you work right. with one of those systems? Not in the recruiting process, oh. we didn't. We would do that... Uh, with folks who are already hired, you know, to help them better understand how they operate and how to better interact with others who are a little bit different. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, that's valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have someone who, someone who is uh, very kinesthetic, you have a student that's very kinesthetic, then it's, it's uh, useful to know, okay, then how can I best in my instruction reach this student who may not be particularly uh, good at reading? Okay, but mm -hmm. they, they're good in this way. So in yeah. that way, it's useful. That's amazing. Did you hear that German school system? That's something you should do with your students as well. <laughs> Address no, I, their individual needs. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I definitely have heard from a lot of people in the U.S. though, like, especially, yeah, I don't know, when it comes to like Californian tech companies as well, sometimes they get a little crazy with their interview processes where I definitely have heard of people using those type of things in their recruiting process, but... Um, it's normally at really big companies that have too much time on their hands. 
-hmm. it's pretty simple. You know, you ask a candidate, uh, tell, uh, I want you to think about a time that you were particularly pleased and very happy. And then uh, what was what was the event or the occurrence? And and personally, you couldn't care less what it is. They just you just want them to name something. But then the the follow up question is, and why why did this impress you? Why were you pleased? And that's where you get into whether they're self actualized or or primarily a maintenance person. So it's pretty easy to figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah you don't necessarily need, need to work with those predetermined systems yeah. you can just use your what, what I mentioned kindness. Don't mention fish, yeah yeah what's mentioned kindness in English? <laughs> yeah your uh, knowledge of people I don't know yeah okay. <laughs> there's a nice way that we put it in English but I can't think of it Men mention fish day, huh yeah yeah um, what's your experience with that Tom so um, normally it's not common so but I worked for a company in the past so they did these personality tests mm. okay. um, but especially for um, higher positions, uh, like um, head of positions or um, manager positions in general. Um, and it was like, I mean, you have tons of, of different tests. Um, and it was like an assessment center we did. Uh, like it was like a, a three interview step and, and you, you, have to prepare a, a use case and you you had to prepare like this personal test that you're doing in like 10 or 20 minutes um, and this is more like an additional information but it's not um, the final decision if you're hiring someone or not mm -hmm. it was like more additionally to the whole thing to understand this kind of personality and did you guys like when you first um, wrote the job description, did you think, oh, for this position, we need someone who is more of a no, whatever type? not okay. really, no. Yeah. I'd add that uh, d depends on the position. I have a, a dive buddy friend of mine who uh, works at night. He is not able to contact anyone at night. And I asked him, what did, who does he work for? He says, I can't tell you. Well, what do you do? And I, he says, I can't tell you. Uh, and finally he said, well, I, I plan. And um, <laughs> so for him... There are also, someone mentioned CIA earlier. Uh, for him, the background checks and the personality checks and all the rest of that stuff is yeah. heightened because of uh, the type of work he does. Mm. But that would yeah. be a special case. Yeah. Those are always interesting people. We had a couple in my, uh, like, I guess, network will say that we knew that they had some sort of special job, yeah. but we just yeah. we didn't know what, where they worked. Uh, physically or in the name of the company, <laughs> yeah, company, right? Uh, what they did, where they were, <laughs> the, yeah. the yeah. company. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that in How I Met Your Mother. Um, if any of you have watched that, um, the character of Barney, to until the end of the whole show, you never know what he does for a living. Mm. <laughs> it's always exactly. A I had a former student who uh, just seemed to show up around the world at these uh, major political events of sorts uh and uh you know what what is he what is he doing don't ask don't ask <laughs> <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> mysterious um, when it comes to hiring someone let's say we've found the the proper candidate um or what we think the proper candidate is and we want to make them an offer uh what type of information is provided to them in that offer i mean obviously you get a contract or uh, um, a work agreement that is sent to them but as far as benefits surrounding uh, the job is concerned, what what does that conversation look like or what information is important to communicate or gets communicated to the candidate? So um, we normally provide a draft of the contract, so there like general stuff in it, like salary. Um, we have also, depending on the role, um, uh, car allowance agreements or um, company car agreements. Um, but normally, like not the typical benefits. We're writing down like, okay, 30 days of vacation time. Um, Which we've talked have, about a lot. The, the yeah. yeah. <laughs> big <laughs> amount of vacation days, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also like some additional information like um, resignation times, uh, mm -hmm. probation time. Um, but benefits are mostly kind of discussed in the interview step mm -hmm. or you can normally find all the information on the home pages. 
as far the as short, um, the short answer, yeah, yeah. As far as probationary periods and resignation periods are concerned, um, that was the other topic I want to talk about was resignation. Um, what would you say is standard in your experience as far as probationary and then also resignation periods? Of course, we're in Germany. Everything is ruled by law. Um, so probation time is normally six months. Um, you can have a shorter version. So the one company I worked with had like just three months. Mm -hmm. So and then you can extend these to six months. Um, but normally, it's common to have six months probation time, and resignation time depends a lot. So it depends on if you're in a union. In, in German, it's called um, Arbeitgeberverband. So you will have a union labor agreement. It depends on the company itself. Um, some companies just having like the normal standard from law, but you can also have extended resignation time, especially in tech companies. So you have normally re um, resignation time for three months till the end of the month. Um, so it's not like four weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. It depends a lot. But by law? By law, it's um, like ruled in some steps. So uh, depending on the time you're working for the company, okay. uh, from in probation time, two weeks um, till like three months as well when you're working like more than 10 years for a company, for example. What do benefits look like in the US, Mark? What, or what, as far as when you're communicating the package, we'll say? Uh, frequently, the candidate will know all that before they even apply, uh, because we have a in Washington State we have a state salary schedule, and yeah. uh, some of those salaries are augmented by um, a, what they call levy equalization funding, uh, so that smaller districts aren't put at a terrible disadvantage, although they still are. But nevertheless, uh, they'll know that salary schedule, and mm -hmm. then they'll know what the what the benefits are, you know, the health insurance and so forth. So. You know that's that's pretty straightforward, and uh, like I say, it it may come up in the interview just to uh, you know the candidate just wants to double check, mm -hmm. uh, but they you know teachers all have a contract for X number of days. Uh, what is it? One hundred eighty three. It used to be. I don't know what it is now, but uh, you know mm -hmm. that's the same. They uh, they're paid uh, at least in the districts I've been in. They're paid once a month uh, at the end of the month, so. It's all pretty straightforward. That's an interesting difference because in, in a lot of jobs in the U.S., um, you're not being paid once a month, but biweekly, right? Yes, right? In a lot that's of jobs, the typical. In some jobs, even weekly, depending like if you work um, mm -hmm. at a restaurant or something like that, for example, I think people get like weekly paychecks, whereas in Germany, mm -hmm. I had never really heard of that before. Monthly. Yeah, monthly is like in every type of job, I feel like that's the standard. Yeah. Even when I was an intern, I would get my like 300 euros a month once a month. <laughs> Uh, teachers would often say that, uh, well, they have that the long winter break, which is usually two weeks and starts in uh, December, and then their next paycheck doesn't come until the end of January. So they used to call that the longest, January was the longest two months of the year. So they're not being <laughs> yeah. paid during school breaks? Like school breaks are like unpaid times for them? No, you'll get, they'll get their check when they leave for the break. Okay. okay, but then they won't. They won't have another check coming until the end of the of January. I have some family that is in the education system in Ohio, um, and I know that in Ohio we have a, a different retirement system for educators. Mm -hmm. um, as a and that's kind of what this question was getting at, as far as the topic of four hundred one k IRAs and various um, uh, retirement benefits that come with companies. Without wanting to get into the details of it, yeah, it's getting complicated. Um, yeah, I really. Yeah, I don't want to get into the details of it, but. Um, is that something that is also true in Washington, that the education system kind of yes. has their own separate system? Yes. Uh, there was, I was in uh, what they call Teachers Retirement System 1, and um, it's no longer offered, but uh, you get a, a certain proportion of your, of your top two earning years, and that uh, forms your pension. Now they have other, uh, two, uh, Plan 2 and Plan 3, and which uh, I'm glad I'm not in it, but you can mm -hmm. invest and so on and so forth. Um, so they do have a definite uh, retirement system. It's kind of similar to what law enforcement does. And uh, but anyway, is that also true for health insurance that there's a separate system, or mm -hmm. maybe well, yeah, well, I guess separate maybe system is putting it oddly, but 
It's the Public Employees Benefit Board. And okay. uh, within that, there are several different types of health and health insurance, different models that, that a district can choose. Okay. Uh, so some district health insurance might be better than another district. And likewise, uh, each employee has the opportunity to uh, have money withdrawn for a 401k if mm-hmm. they choose to do that, and they can put that wherever they want. Okay. But yeah, those are two things. That's what I just wanted to touch on as well as far as the U.S. is concerned. Um, your retirement and health insurance are both two things that are discussed um, when it comes mm-hmm. to before signing a contract or an agreement is understanding what your benefits are and in, in regards to what options are available to you for health insurance. Um, normally, there are a couple of different plans that a, yes. an employer will offer and they give you the information about that. And then you have to choose when you start uh, which plan you want. Um, and it's all through your employer. It's not like in Germany where you have your uh, health insurance and then you just tell your employer which one you're with. Um, and then as far as retirement is concerned, there's often um, a discussion around the 401k, which is just the it's a piece of law that it basically sets up that type of system. Um, but there are normally matching programs for retirement savings that are offered by employers. So you talk about, mm-hmm. okay, what percentage of my... Um, salary will be matched for the retirement savings. Um, Can you explain so those what are all matched co- means real quick? Yeah, so normally uh, you, I forget, and maybe Mark, you have more information on this because I'm a little bit out of the 401k game now. Uh, but normally what will happen is up to a certain percent percentage of your pay. Well, where, they're basically also paying the same amount yes, from their end. exactly, exactly. So basically you're putting 6% of your pay into your 401k, half of which is paid by you, half of which is paid by your employer. And sometimes you can go above and beyond that as far as your individual contribution to a 401k, but a benefit that a company will offer is that they will have a higher matching. The the, the 401k thing, that's that's not standardized uh, in Washington State. However, the employee can say, I want 3% pulled out and uh, thrown mm-hmm. into my 401k. Um, there are things like sick leave that can be matched. The rule of thumb is that when you hire when you hire an employee, there's the salary that they're going to earn, but then you tack on another thirty percent for benefits. So the okay. true cost of of the employee is the salary that he, that he or she will earn, and then another thirty percent in benefits, whether it's health care or whatever. So, okay. But it's all run through the through the company. Through Quick the question: industry. How is sick leave regulated among teachers? You can earn X number of do- X number of days per year or hours. Actually, they figure it out down to, and um, if you don't use it, you can bank them up to a certain amount. Okay. And for example, my last year, I didn't use any sick leave, and then when I uh, when I retired, they uh, I could take twenty five percent of that and translated into uh, dollars, and I threw it into what's called a a VEBA account, which is an account you can then use and draw on for medical, dental, you know, vision expenses after you've retired. Interesting. Well, now we kind of did get into, like, the the complicated (laughs) stuff. 401k is just the name of, like, one private or personal retirement account Mm -hmm. or type that they have in the U.S. because there's, like, so many different routes that you can take in that regard, and then you usually do that. Um, decide that on your own as the person, and then if your employer offers to match that or or do it for you, um, then they can. But I, I, it's never required, right? You can't, as an individual without a job, uh, have a four or you can have a four hundred one k. You just can't invest into it. It's it's a retirement retirement program through your employer. Yeah, and so then the there's employer an IRA has to offer and then Roth IRA and yes. other so types. IRA, our <laughs> IRA is sim- a Roth IRA or an IRA is similar to it for individuals. Mm. Um, but a 401k is through an employer. It's it's very complicated. It's complicated. And those are all things and those are all things that are discussed as far as benefits in the US when starting a job, which mm-hmm. is not the case in Germany. Germany it's very simple um, <laughs> compared to the US, but yeah, and the what uh, you normally discuss your vacation days, sick days. Yeah, I wanted to throw then, out the sick days just one more time. Yeah. I think we've mentioned it in previous episodes, but in Germany, you don't have sick days. You can just be sick whenever. And there's, of course, certain regulations that come with that. If you're sick for a certain amount of time, you're going to have to have a doctor's notice. If you're sick for months, then there is other consequences with that. But you don't get 10 sick days at the beginning of the year. And then once you've been sick 10 times, then you don't get paid if you don't show up, which is 10 days is like a common number that I've heard a lot in the US. 
that's how it's handled on a lot of jobs in the U.S. that you have your vacation days. And then in addition to that, which are also not a lot or no, five sick days, I think. is what Yeah, I was going to say 10 five. sick days is a lot. 10 is yeah. the vacation days, <laughs> yeah. which is also ridiculous. So 10 vacation days and then five sick days. Um, and then once you've used those up, then basically there's penalties for you because then you just won't mm-hmm. get paid if you don't show up or might even get fired or et cetera. So that's definitely an interesting difference right there. Yes. So it's not not common in, in Germany, um, but so the company where my my mom works, so they have kind of sick days, um, mm-hmm. but just without the uh, sick note from the doctor. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. say, okay, you have kind of four or five days, so you can use them. Um, but I think that this is a really like old fashioned thing. Mm-hmm. So normally, if you're sick, you're sick. Um, if you're sick, extremely sick, you go to, anyway to the doctor and get a sick note, and that's probably it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, uh, in, in Washington, some, some districts have gotten away from does stipulating whether it's a sick day or a personal day. They just say you have so many days of leave, yeah. you know, go for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And uh, you know, we've uh, had people who had uh, severe illnesses. They used up their six days, so some of their colleagues or others in the district can donate some of their sick leave to that oh. other person if they need it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, in Germany, I mean, I feel like in most um, cases, it's like you can be sick without a doctor's note for three days, mm-hmm. right? And after the thir- two days? Tom, two or three. Depends. Okay, okay so, it depends. So, so it two depends or three days, company. you just call in and you're like, hey, I'm not feeling great. I'm not coming in today. Nobody asks nope. any questions. No consequences. You're fine. Um, and then after two or three days, you are required to show a doctor's note to prove that you're actually sick. But you still don't have to stick to a certain number of sick days for a year. That's why districts went away from that goofy bookkeeping you know, is it two days for a doctor's certificate or a three? Mm. And they just yeah. got rid of the whole thing. <laughs> well, one more question that I do think we should talk about is um, because if people are listening right now that want to come to Germany or to the U.S. from another country, um, what is it like with work permits? And I promise this is the second to last question. After that, I have one last final question that I think is going to round everything up. Um, but how do you guys handle that. Maybe it's also handled differently for teachers than in other industries in the U.S. I don't know. I've heard, at least in the U.S., that in a lot of jobs, especially since I'm also not a U.S. citizen and for international students applying for jobs after college, this was a big topic, that a lot of companies were supposedly literally just not even looking at applications from people who had checked that little box saying that they're Mm -hmm. not a U.S. citizen because it would cause all this extra work and even money for the company because they would then have to sponsor the person for a work permit or work visa. Um, Is that your experience, Mark? Or how did you guys handle non-American applicants? And then we'll talk about how it's done in Germany afterwards. I'm trying to remember Ah. uh, non-American applicants. I did have a young lady who was a substitute teacher. She was British. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Uh, But I think she had an what they call an emergency certification. Okay. But... uh, you know, Fela, you you know, know more about this than I would. So it's, I mean, you, I've you just, just heard all these it. rumors. And as I said, the teaching yeah. system might just be very different than um, yeah. other industries where, you know, the job market is just different. But I've just heard that that is a case, that, that that's a thing that once yeah. they see you're not an American citizen, um, they don't even look at your application. What I have seen in a lot of um, job descriptions for the U.S. is uh, they'll explicitly say that um, they do not sponsor um, they do not sponsor visas. So oftentimes what will happen is um, if you have a green card or a valid work permit that you don't have to do anything for as far as sponsorship is concerned, then that's something that's important for a company to know. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, if they if there's sponsorship required, um, then yeah, oftentimes they they will get sorted out, or it's much more much 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 more difficult to get a yeah. an interview. Yeah, because what happens then, as far as sponsorship is concerned, the com- companies will have to prove that there isn't an American citizen who can do the job. That and then um, they have to file a lot of forms for exactly. you. And if they even try to get you a green card, which some employers are nice enough to do, then they usually provide you an immigration lawyer yeah. and pay for that. And um, takes them a lot of time and, and money and resources to do that kind of stuff. Um, Tom, what's your experience with that? I, th- I believe that at least the system is a little bit easier in Germany. Yes, yes it is easier. So first of all, it depends from where you're from. So if you're from European countries or in the European Union, 
So you were free to work in all the European, most of the European countries. So this is not really an issue. Um, but if you're not from the EU, uh, so then the things are getting a little bit complicated. So you have to go to the Ausländerbehörde of your local town or city. And uh, then you have to kind of apply for it. But fun fact, you need to have a kind of a job. So you need already a contract to get like um, the, um, the blue card or the Aufenthaltstitel. This is like really time consuming, but it's not like that you have to pay or sponsor someone. So you're just providing information in the, in the best way, the contract already. So um, additional information, um, I think it's like a, f a formula of like three pages that yeah. you're writing down. Okay, this person is living there. Uh, he will or she will be employed in here. Working hours, uh, salary. Urlaubstage. Yeah, or, yeah, vacation days. So we provide everything. So it's part of our normal process that we are providing this information. Yeah. Um, putting the signature and the stamp on it. Um, sending this uh, to the applicant or to the Ausländerbehörde itself. Um, and they have to check with the authority for unemployed people um, if there's kind of a German unemployed guy capable of doing this. So then you have to explain why this person is it. So especially when there are difference in salary. So you need around, I'm not sure, like but something around 60,000 euros a year to get the blue card. Yeah, Josh knows, um, knows all it's, about it's, that. It's a little less. I think it's like 58.4. Oh. <laughs> but yes. Josh is an so, expert. So, so, <laughs> so this is, <laughs> if this is not the case, so you have to explain why you especially need this person mm. and not one from the German unemployed market. Mm. But then that's probably it. You have to wait like a long, long time for the actually Aufenthaltstitel. So you get a Fiktionsbescheinigung, like a small kind of paper. Um, that says, okay, you're allowed to stay here and work here for like kind of three months till you get the final version. So, mm -hmm. but it takes, so German bureaucracy is hard in this case. For sure. But I would say much more easier than in the US. Yeah, yeah as far as the employer like. is concerned, it's it's much less work. You just so have to for provide you guys, the information. as recruiters, was it ever a reason not to hire someone or would that also fall under the discrimination law? <laughs> or is that something no comment <laughs> um, so you, you it, it depends if someone is working still in, in their home country so you have to check so okay how you will manage to get those person to, to Germany mm. so for example we, we had this in the company before we had a relocation provider they helped us moving those guys so they they took care of nearly everything. So we mm. paid them a huge amount of money to take care for the whole bureaucracy thing, like with the um, embassy in their home country. And the time when they they arriving here, so we are paying for flight. We are um, paying them for to find the, an apartment, to find probably place for school or kindergarten if the family is coming with them. Um, and you can spend spend thousands of, of euros uh, for these kind of stuff. So you you still have to, to ask yourself, is it worth it? Right. So so normally my company, so it's a little bit different. We need C1 as, as a requirement in German language skills. Mm. So um, because we are work, normally our customers say in the, the German Mittelstand and mostly none of the applicants from outside of Europe are capable to speak German. Mm. So, um, and we cannot provide like teacher and stuff and so on. And they are working here in English because we have like German customers. So for us, it's not working out. For bigger companies, um, it is definitely working out, but it's like a money question most mm. of the time. Yeah. Okay, guys, um, let's wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for your time and for all of your information. I do have that one final question <laughs> that I think um, hopefully can help people out there. So um, for each of you, what would be 
the number one tip that you would give applicants that they should do or not do? Maybe there's like a mistake that you always see or you've always seen back in the day, Mark, that um, would hurt people's chances to actually get hired. So what's your number one tip for anyone out there that might be looking for a job in the U.S.? maybe specifically a teaching job. Okay, my, uh, my tip, and I think it would apply to any job, is when you are being interviewed, listen very carefully to the question. Mm -hmm. Is it a yes-no question, or is it a question that's open-ended? And then directly answer the question and stop talking. And then you can say, would you like to hear more? But the uh, big mistake is people just start rattling off and on and on and on, and that won't work. So answer, recognize the question, answer it specifically, and then ask if you want to hear more. Interesting. That's a tip I've never heard before. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tom? I, I kind of disagree to this in, in German. So I think also in Germany, it's like totally different. So you can talk and talk and talk. So at some point, we will interrupt someone, but... So, but we let them talk because we want to know people. Mm -hmm. um, my tip number one is um, be authentic. So if you play kind of a game, so this is not working for long. So people will recognize it at some point, even if in, in some phrases or like small little situation, um, latest when people starting work there, so there's still probation time. So you, you, should be authentic from the from the very first beginning. Yeah, because otherwise it's gonna come exactly. back and haunt you, bite your butt, <laughs> yep. bite you bite in the you butt. In the butt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, in the probation period, and then you're not gonna make it through those six months. Yep. Okay, that's that's a great tip. Thank you both for sharing yes. all of your knowledge and expertise. And um, as I said, we talked a little bit more about work culture and office culture and also a little bit about benefits and the health insurance stuff um, in our episode with Niklas. There would be so much more stuff to talk about, obviously. <laughs> um, some of the viewer questions that we also had regarded, um, you know, how informal and formal can you talk to your colleagues? Um, why do you have to bring your own birthday cake in German offices when it's your birthday and not the other people come and celebrate you? Or like, why do you host your own um starting at an office party or going away party, stuff like that. Um, there would be so much to talk about. But for today, I think we've covered everything that we wanted to cover in one of our last episodes of the podcast, actually. Yes. So I'm glad we still so, get it done. <laughs> so I'm really upset that you stop the, the podcast, actually. Um, but anyway, if some of all the listeners have some additional questions, I will provide as well my LinkedIn address. Aww. So people can write me directly if they have some questions especially for, for Germany. So I would be happy to help. Nice. Thank you so much for Thank offering you. that. I'm sure there will be some questions. <laughs> Probably. Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and th thank you both for being here. Yes, thank you Thanks guys for so having much. Thank you. Thank you. Just a big thank you again to Mark and Tom for taking the time to talk with us. Um, we know that it's not always easy to find the time uh, in your day to have these type of conversations. And we know that a lot of people... And we hope that a lot of you viewers uh, and listeners will be able to use some of that information mm -hmm. as uh, you're looking into moving abroad as well. So thank you again um, for taking the time and providing all of that information from the insight of people who actually know what they're talking about in those fields, not just to us with our everyday experience that we have had with it. With our gefährliches Halbwissen, with our exactly. dangerous half-knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you guys for sticking with us and for listening. We really made sure that this is an extra long episode. Take it as making up for the last episode that we skipped. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is the last topic episode mm -hmm. that we're doing for the podcast. Um, the next episode is going to be our last episode. And for that, we're going to try and make it a little bit special. And we're going to wait until we're back together in person to record that, which is going to be at the end of September. So with that being said, um, it's going to be at least a few weeks until that comes out. Um, don't know exactly when we'll be able to record it and then how long it'll take me to edit it and have it out. So it'll most likely be in October. So just a heads up for you to know. Um, but we do hope that you'll tune in for that last episode with us. Yes, it's, it's sad to think of it coming to an end. But um, yeah, we, we are looking forward to looking back on, on this uh, experience that we've had with each other and hope that you guys join in to listen to that as well. Mm -hmm. 
If you guys have any specific questions that you maybe want us to answer in that last episode, no promises, but um, feel free to send us an email at understandingtrainstation at gmail.com. Maybe you just have like a specific insider question about uh, which recording software we've always used or, you know, those kinds of behind the scenes um, information that you, you've you always wondered about. Um, let us know. Or if you just want to send us kind of like a goodbye message, uh, we might actually do a category in that last episode where we read some of your messages that we've already received. Some of you um, told us about the situations that you always listen to the podcast to, that you always... In. Was that English? The situations you would say that... In. Oh, yeah, the situations that you always listen to the podcast in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. So that's also something that if you want to send us something like that, feel free to do so. You can also send it on Instagram. And then we might be able to include it into the last episode. We would love to kind of have that last episode um, include you guys as a community as well. So, yeah, make sure to let us know if you have any uh, any of those questions or comments. We'll be looking in the comments uh, section and on all of the social media areas to make sure that we see, see everything that you guys are sending us. So um, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the second to last episode. Um, and we will talk to you guys in the near future. <laughs> in October, probably. <laughs> Until then, choose. Choose. Choose.